Well, welcome back to the Common Man's Take on Sports podcast. Uh, there's a few things I'd like to unpack today. Uh, but first, I'd like to start with the Damian Lillard saga. So, that all started towards the end of last season. They had their second straight losing season and, and missed the playoffs. And so they shut Dame Lillard down towards the end of the year. And then you could tell he was unhappy. And so before the draft, he went to the front office to talk to the general manager and owner. And so he requested that Portland use their high draft pick to trade for another superstar to play along him so Portland could stay in the stay competitive in the West and, and maybe play for a championship. And so <clears throat> before the draft, Portland didn't trade their pick. During the draft, they didn't trade it. And then after the draft, they didn't trade it. Uh, they ended up drafting Scoot, Hen- drafting Scoot Henderson, who will probably turn into a good NBA player. And that's yet to be seen. Obviously, he hasn't played a game yet. Uh, but he seems like a pretty decent player from what I've seen in the summer league. But what Dame didn't want to do, and the reason why he requested to trade that pick for a proven superstar, is we don't know what Scoot Henderson's going to be. We can guess, but we don't know. And so Lillard doesn't want to wait around to find out, which you can kind of sympathize with that because you know he's been in Portland for 11 years. He stayed loyal to him for a very long time. Um, he resigned with him a couple of times. And, uh, you know, he's he's 33 years old now, so, you know, he's starting to get up in age, and he knows that at this point in his career he needs to contend for championships because he doesn't have much time left. You know, at 33 years old, he's probably got, at best, seven years left of his career as long as he doesn't have any catastrophic injuries or, you know, he doesn't get a ling- lingering injury that just hangs around and hampers him from being the type of player that he is. So far, he's stayed pretty healthy in his career, so he hasn't had that problem. But he knows that time is running out, and he's getting older, and the older players get, you know, the more susceptible to injuries you get. And, you know, if Portland's rebuilding, it it may take a year or two before they even make the playoffs again. So I can see why why Dame would request... Uh, for them to use that draft pick to get another superstar in so we could contend now and not have to worry about the unknown. Well, Portland went in a different direction. So after the draft, uh, Dame went back to the front office and said, well, I would like a trade. But normally players, when they ask for trades, they give a couple of teams, usually contending teams, that they're interested in being traded to or would go to in a trade. Well, Dame only gave one team, the Miami Heat. He doesn't want to go anywhere else. I'm assuming he must have some relationships with some players on that team, so I I get it and understand it. But by doing that, he's kind of tied Portland's hands a little bit because now, you know, Portland wants a reasonable package in return for a star like Damian Lillard. Damian Lillard is their franchise star, you know, their franchise player. He has been for several years. So to trade away a franchise player like that, not knowing if Scoot Henderson is going to be the next franchise player or not, you want something comparable in return, right? And just to put that in perspective, last year, Dame Lillard averaged 32.2 points per game, uh, 7.3 assists, 4.8 rebounds. He shot 91% from the free throw line. 37% from three-point line where he was making 4.2 three-pointers out of 11.3 attempted per game. His field goal percentage was 46%. Uh, And, of course, he played 58 games because they shut him down. But the other interesting fact is he was playing 36.3 minutes per game last year, which is, you know, up there for a 48-minute game. So, you know, he's putting in some work for Portland. 
if you go back and look at his stats over the years for Portland, it, he's been a, a pretty solid star for them uh, as long as he's been there. So shortly after he asked for the trade to Miami Heat, Portland and Miami Heat talked. Miami Heat offered a package and Portland turned down the first package and said, you know, hey, we need to work on this package because we're not happy with the return for Dane Lillard. We would like to negotiate some of these terms. So then it, it kind of went dead for a while. You didn't hear much about it. And then uh, another story came out and it was a story about Dame Lillard's agent. And so everybody knows that players hire agents to get them what they want, right? Whether it's a contract or a trade to a certain destination. Like that's what agents do. They negotiate these things. So Dame's agent apparently was other teams have been calling about Dame Lillard to see what Portland wanted for him or his availability or if they could even trade for him. And so Portland was open to trading to more than just Miami. And so then Dame's agent was telling these other teams, hey, if you trade for him, he's going to be disgruntled because he doesn't want to be anywhere but Miami. So he may not give you 100% effort. Uh, he may even sit out some games. And so then all this got back to the league office. My guess is one of the teams that, again, I don't know this for certain. I don't have any inside intel. I'm just you know, taking a guess here. One of the teams must have told the front office this was happening because then the front office called Dane Lillard and his agent in to talk to him. So they asked them, or are you guys telling teams that if you get traded there that you're not going to play or give 100%? It's like, you know, you're in a contract, so you have to meet the requirements in your contract. Of course, the agent was like, well, I wasn't really saying that. And so basically the NBA told him, knock it off. Uh, and since they really didn't punish Dame or his agent, my guess is they told him, uh, you know, hey, whatever deal you in Portland cut with whatever team you go to, that's fine. But don't go around telling teams that you're not going to play for them if you go there. You're under contract. You're making it look like the NBA doesn't have any control over its players and its players just do whatever they want. I mean, we can't have that. So stop telling teams you're going to do whatever you want to do. And so then it's been quiet on that front for a while. But then Richard Jefferson said something the other day that kind of caught me by surprise. He was talking about Donovan Mitchell, who's another great player and star in this league. And he said, you know, Donovan Mitchell, you need to figure it out because you don't want to be another Dame Lillard. And at first I didn't, couldn't figure out what he meant by that. Like, another Dame Lillard? What? I, you know, I'm a Dame Lillard fan. I'm not a Portland Trailblazers fan, but I'm a Dame Lillard fan. I've watched him play, and Dame Lillard gives you 110% every day that he steps out on that floor. And his teammates love him. They love being around him. You've never heard a, a teammate past or present say anything bad about Dame Lillard. And in here you have Richard Jefferson saying that you don't want to be another Dame Lillard. So then I was, I read the article and I listened to the more of the um, the show that Richard Jefferson was on. So what he was insinuating was that Dame Lillard doesn't make players around him better. And he was trying to tell Donovan Mitchell, you need to figure out how to make the players around you better. And so I thought about that. I was like, Dame Lillard doesn't make the players around him better? What is Richard Jefferson talking about? The guy has averaged no less than five assists a game, but mostly six assists or more. There's only two seasons where he averaged less than six assists a game. There's four seasons where he averaged seven or more. And I'm like, what does he mean? And then I started looking at some of his teammates, like C.J. McCollum. So to this day, C.J. McCollum's best, most efficient season was playing next to Dame Lillard. 
where his field goal percentage was at 46 percent and another season where it was at 48 percent and both of those seasons were playing next to who oh that's right Damian Lillard and he hasn't matched that since he also averaged 23 points per game and 22.1 points per game respectively for those two seasons playing next to Dame Lillard. So then I dug in a little more and I'm like, hmm, let's check out Wesley Matthews, another old, team, old teammate of Dame Lillard. And so I'm looking at him. And so his best season, efficient season, came playing next to Dame Lillard where he averaged 44, 44% field goal percentage, 38% three-point percentage at 15.9 points per game, and another one at 16.4 points per game. And I'm just trying to figure out, what is Richard Jefferson talking about? Like Even Wesley, Wesley Matthews benefited from playing next to Dane Willard, and I'm looking at Nicholas Batum, another old teammate. And so he had his best season playing next to Dame Lillard uh, in most efficient season. 46% field goal percentage, 36% from the three-point line, and 14.3 points per game. And so I'm thinking, isn't that making your teammates better? Making them more efficient by getting them the ball at the right place so they have the best possible shot? And how is that not making your teammates better? So I think Richard Jefferson's way off base here and probably needs to go back to the drawing board and you know do a little more research and a little more analytics because I, I'm just not buying that Dame Lillard doesn't make his teammates better. Not to mention you've never heard any one of his teammates ever say that they didn't like playing with him. They all love playing next to Dame Lillard because he's a good teammate and they know he is. Uh, Richard Jefferson just... I'm not a fan of Richard Jefferson as an announcer or Kendrick Perkins. Uh, neither one of them ever bring facts or analytics or anything. When they're doing their sports analytics, all they do is just make statements, baseless statements, and that's it. And so that's what Richard Jefferson did when he said, when he was implying that Dame Lillard didn't make his teammates better. He was making a baseless statement that has no facts to support it. But here I've just given some facts and stats to support that Dame Lillard does make his teammates better. And his teammates love playing with him, playing next to him. So I think Richard Jefferson should learn how to do his job better. As far as the Dame Lillard saga goes, um, I understand why he wants out of Portland. And it's his right to get out of Portland. It's like anybody's right to change jobs, right? If you're not happy uh, with the company you're with, then you leave. And that's all Dame's trying to do. Uh, I think the one thing that's kind of working against him right now is there's only one place he wants to go. And so it's going to be really hard for Portland to get the assets they're requiring from Miami. But ultimately, I think that Dame will end up in a Miami Heat uniform. I, don't, I think he'll start the season in a Portland uniform. But I think by the end of the year, he'll probably be wearing a Miami Heat probably closer to the trade deadline because Portland will have a little more leverage on Miami then at that point. So, uh, I want to talk about what's going on with college football right now. So, I've been watching this is the other thing I want to unpack here. I, I've been watching the the movements and the three conferences that are loading up. Not They're loading up on teams, but not just any teams. If you look, the Big 12, the SEC, and the Big 10, are not, they're not just adding any teams to their conference. They're adding teams who have huge draws for fans, no matter where they go, whether it's bowl games or at home or away games, they're adding teams that are big money makers. Um, who will make a lot of money for their conferences. And so 
where I'm going with this is I think that college sports are moving in the direction that they, in the near future, I think you're going to see them disassociate themselves with the NCAA and create their own governing body. Maybe they'll do it with the uh, commissioners of each conference, or maybe they'll do it a different way, but I think you're going to see them move away from them, dissociate themselves with the NCAA, and all the NCAA is going to be left with is the group of five teams who don't pull in as much money as these other teams. I mean, UCLA, USC, Oregon, uh, all these teams are, are big money getters, and they all went to the Big Ten, right? Then you've got the SEC, uh, Oklahoma, Texas, big money makers, and they went to the SEC. So really, if both of those conferences want to look at the NCAA next time they try to put a ban or try to initiate any kind of punishment to any one of those teams in those conferences, those conferences could look at the NCAA and go, go pound sand. What are you going to do if we don't honor your punishment? Because we're the money makers. If we go away, you don't make any money anymore. You think the group of five is going to make you the kind of money that we make you right now? No. And so I think you're you're seeing the college sports landscape change. And I think you're going to see the dissolution of the NCAA eventually. And they're going to create their own governing body and there will be no more NCAA. They'll govern themselves. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. Because I think the NCAA is seen as a joke now. Nobody respects them anymore. They pick and choose who they want to punish and who they don't. Uh, they pick and choose what rules they want to enforce and which ones they don't. So I I think that the the NCAA is a joke now. They they have no power over teams anymore. We just watched Kansas. The NCAA supposedly had that whole FBI probe with Bill Self on tape offering players money. And in, the NCAA tried to put a ban on Kansas and Kansas challenged them. They told Bill Self to get a lawyer. He did. He won. And he got a three-game ban. That's it. That's all he got out of that. Uh, and now I think you're seeing the same thing happen at Michigan. The NCAA came after Michigan for some trumped-up charges that they don't really have any proof for. And I think you're seeing Jim Harbaugh went and got himself a lawyer. And I think you're seeing Jim Harbaugh give the middle finger to the NCAA and go... You can't prove it, so I'm not going to do what you want me to do. And I think the fact that the NCAA has backed up off of that four-game punishment, suspension that they were going to give him, and they said that they're going to go back and do some more investigation and take it into the off season. I think that alone proves that the NCAA has no solid real proof that Michigan Coach Harbaugh or any of his assistants did anything wrong other than what they self-reported. And so the the analyst doing coaching on the field, that was self-reported by them a year ago. So the NCAA is acting like they, they found this and discovered this. No, if you go back and look, they self-reported that. So I think you're going to see Jim win that battle, and I think the NCAA is not going to be able to touch him. We'll see what happens. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they'll find something. I guess if they got a whole another year to dig something up, that they're eventually going to find something they can get him for. Uh, but I think it's ridiculous that they're pushing forward with this, and I think Jim's ready for him with his lawyer. So I think that at the end of the day, um, he's probably going to win that. The last thing I'd like to unpack here is the Major League Baseball playoff picture is starting to come into focus now. Um, I am a Yankees fan, but they are not doing so hot this year. Uh, I, I feel like for them, the fact that they made no moves at the trade deadline just shows that they mailed it in for this year. Uh, and they're just waiting for the 
the fall meetings. Um, I, I think they're going to try to win whatever they can win to finish this season out. But I just don't think they're going to make a playoff push. I, I think they're out of it. Um, I'd be surprised if they make it. I hope they make it, but I don't think they're going to make it. Um, but you got Tampa Bay. Obviously, the Astros are in there. Uh, you know, you got, you got a lot of a lot of teams right now that are, are looking really good for the playoff race. Uh, it's starting to come into to focus for the National League and the American League. So we'll see what happens with that. But I. I know that uh, the Yankees are now six in the wild card hunt, so they're way out of it. Uh, you could the National League, you got the Phillies, the Giants, the Marlins are right there. Cubs are half a game out, Reds are half a game out. So the, the National Leagues, you got a couple of teams that are right there on each other's heels that uh, still have a chance to make it in. Talk a little more about that uh, as the the picture starts becoming more clear. But uh, I think that uh, that's looking. Uh, you're starting to to shape up. You're here in the next couple of weeks. You're gonna pretty much be said of the teams that are gonna make the playoffs. The other thing I'd like to talk about is I don't know if anybody saw that that fight that Tim Anderson got into where he got knocked out on the field. That was uh, pretty interesting. Let me pull this up. I cannot remember the player's name that he got in the fight with. Jose Ramirez. Uh, he tried to pick a fight with Mr. Ramirez, and Ramirez gave him the business. <clears throat> Knocked him down there, fell in the field. That was, uh, I guess that's what happens. Uh, when you you start uh, something you can't finish. Uh, let me, let me, uh, you guys can leave your comments. Let me know what you think about that fight between Anderson uh, hmm. what your thoughts are um, last thing I want to talk about is you know college football is right around the corner starts uh, Labor Day weekend starts that Thursday I believe is the first games and goes all weekend long until Labor Day on Monday and then the next weekend after that is the NFL football is back We'll be covering some NFL and college football here real soon. I'm a Panthers fan and a uh, Ravens fan, so we will uh, talk a little bit about that and see what they look like. We'll also see what uh, some of the other teams in the NFL are going to look like and cover what we think some of these, uh, how some of these teams are going to do before the season starts. With that, I will end our second episode. My partner, Quentin, will be back uh, for the next episode when we talk about the NFL and maybe a little bit of college football because both are coming up here real soon. Uh, as for now, I thank you guys for listening. I hope you continue to subscribe and listen to our podcast. That's it for today, the common man's take on sports.